Hi guys, I was just sitting here playing my tin whistle up by the fire on a miserable winter's day. And I was just thinking about the physics of everything that goes on inside an instrument like this. So today's episode is going to be all about the physics of wind instruments and how they actually make the noises that they do. There's loads of different types of wind instruments. There's saxophones, clarinets, flutes, oboes, bassoons, tin whistles, loads and loads of different types. And they all have the same basic fundamental physics behind them that explains everything about the sound that is coming out of them. So we'll start with the tin whistle. Well, it's a good place to start. The first thing we need to know before we can start thinking about how sound works, we need to make sure we understand the difference between a high pitched and a low pitched sound. So I'll start by playing a low pitched sound on my tin whistle. <clears throat> That's low pitched. Now I'll play a high pitched sound. So our ears can clearly tell the difference. You hear, ah, ah, and you can perceive that, that difference of low to high pitch. But what is it actually? What, what's the difference? What's actually going on? Well, we're going to have to visualize the sound if we want to do that. So we're going to visualize the sound waves and we're going to look at them as if they were like waves on the ocean, something like that. So let's take a look at what a low pitched sound wave might look like if we could visualize it. <clears throat> See those waves that it forms? Yeah. So this is a visualization of the type of sound wave that we can imagine. Let's look and see what a high-pitched sound wave would look like with our visualization. <clears throat> see the difference? One is long and one is short. So those low-pitched sounds, yeah, they seem like these really long waves that are kind of dragged out. Whereas the high-pitched sounds seem like really short waves yeah, that happen more quickly. Well, we have another term that we use in physics other than pitch, we call it frequency. Okay? So we would say that those long waves are low frequency because they're big and long and we can imagine they only come every so often because they're quite long. Whereas the shorter waves, we call them high frequency because you can see them, they would be like do 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 They come a little bit more often, so we call them high frequency. And the thing we need to make sure we understand is how we measure the length of a wave. Now, if we see that picture that we had where we had our low frequency and our high frequency, our low pitch and high pitch waves, if we want to measure the length of a wave, we can measure from the top of one part of the wave to the top of the next part of a wave. We also call it the crest. And that is the wave length. So you can see that these low pitch sounds have long wavelengths and these high pitch sounds have short wavelengths. So that's all well and good, but what do I really mean? What are these strange, funny lines that I'm showing you? We don't actually see them when we make sound. So what, what do they represent? Well, sound waves, yeah, which is how sound is traveled, are just pressure waves. It's a difference in air pressure. When there's some sort of a sound emitted by an instrument like this, it's pushing and pulling at the air and it's actually squishing it together in some places and stretching it apart in other places. And in other places, it stays just the same as it always is. And these waves, what you can think of is the top part of the wave represents high pressure, where the air is being squished together. The bottom part of the wave represents low pressure, where the air is being stretched apart. And the part in the middle, in between, that's just atmospheric pressure. It's just a normal pressure in the room. So you can see when a wave comes out of an instrument, it's actually squishing and pulling and squishing and pulling the air around. And that's what's causing this whole, um, this whole sound to occur. Now, if we want to get into a bit more detail into how these instruments work and why they make the sounds they do, we're going to have to start with a slightly more basic instrument. So let's go take a look at a little instrument I made custom just for this. So here is my super high tech piece of equipment that I put together and we're going to use to explain the basic physics of wind instruments. So what are we looking at here? Well, we have two different pipes, any old pipes will do, doesn't matter what they are, just the one on the inside needs to be just a little bit smaller than the one on the outside. And we just need to hold them upright in any sort of container, a bucket, anything at all, and we need to make sure that the bottom of it is sealed. 
And why is that? Well, we're gonna fill the whole thing with water and you'll see why we need to do that in just a minute. So we fill the whole thing up with water. Just keep going. There we go. So what's happened here now is this outer tube is right full up to the very top of water and this inner tube can be moved up and down. But how is this thing going to explain to us how the physics of sound inside a wind instrument works? Well, all this contraption is, is a really easy way of changing the length of a pipe, just very slight amounts. And what we can see is there's water up as far as here, yes, just up to the top of the, the black pipe. So this white pipe, yeah, there's air in this white pipe down as far as here, and then it's all water. So as far as the sound is concerned, most of the sound will go down here, yeah, travel through the air, and when it hits the water, it'll bounce back. And if I pull up the pipe, boom, suddenly it's a longer pipe. Yeah, now the pipe goes from here down until it hits the water, and we keep adjusting that to whatever length we want. Now, musical instruments, wind instruments, are all about changing the length of pipes. That's basically what they all are. So I'm going to show you here what that's got to do with sound. I'm going to use a little app on my phone here. Um, it's a tone generator. It just generates a particular tone of a particular frequency. So here's a frequency here. It's about mid-range. Do you hear it? I'm going to hold it near to the pipe and I'm going to change the length of the pipe and see if you hear anything weird. Hear that? It gets loud and quiet. If I move it slightly, it's louder. So there's a particular length that amplifies that particular um, note. Okay, what if I change the note? I'll change it something a bit lower. Here we go, you hear this one? Let me hold it next to the pipe and I'll change the length of the pipe. Hear that, it's loud, quiet. Loud, quiet, like so. So we can see that for different lengths of the pipe, different musical notes are amplified. And this uh, amplification, we call it um, resonance. And every single material and every single instrument has a particular resonant frequency that it'll resonate at. And by changing around the length of the pipe, you change the resonant frequency. And that changes the note that comes out and thereby allows you to make songs. So we can see that, okay, but why is it happening? What's the reason for this? What's actually going on inside this pipe? Well, we need to think about something that what we call in physics is called boundary conditions. Now, they're really important in physics, but what are the boundary conditions here? The boundary is just the edge of something. So the boundary conditions of this white pipe, yeah, that's our little instrument, is at this end, it's open to the air, and at this end, it's closed because it hits the water. So the boundary conditions for a sound wave in here is we can have atmospheric pressure at the top. Remember we talked about waves having atmospheric pressure? But at the bottom, we can push or we can stretch the sound, okay? What does that mean? What we're actually pushing and stretching is the molecules of air. So if you think about that high pressure and low pressure, what we're doing is we're pushing and stretching and pushing and stretching. That's what the sound is doing when it goes into the pipe. So it's going up and down and up and down and up and down. And it moves at a certain speed, yeah? The sound moves at a certain speed. So if we want to amplify it or resonate, that means that the speed that the sound moves at, yeah, has to match up with the length of it. Okay? If the sound is being, if you think about pushing someone on a swing, you have to push at just the right time and you amplify their swing. They swing more and more and more. So as the sound goes in, if we have it just the right length for the right frequency of tone, that as the sound waves are going, they're getting bounced, doom, 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 and they amplify over and over again. So that's what's actually happening here. We need to have that situation where we can have the high and low pressure at the bottom and we can be open to the air at the top. So we saw instruments that are open at one end. What about instruments that are open at two ends? Like this tin whistle. So the tin whistle has two, two openings. One here, yeah, you blow in here, of course, but you have one opening here and you have one opening at the end. That's if you've covered all, all the holes with your fingers. Now, 
Of course, what you'll have figured out is that on a tin whistle, we change the sound by just moving our fingers, just lifting one finger or the other. And what we're doing is just changing the length of the pipe. Because wherever is the first situation where we're connected to atmospheric pressure, that's just going to be the end of our pipe. So if I just blow into it without holding any holes, well, it's going to be the very same as if the tin whistle was just this long. Okay? So that's, that, that's the reason why we do that. So let's take a look and see what the sound waves would be inside this tin whistle when we satisfy the boundary conditions. Remember those boundary conditions said that we must have uh, atmospheric pressure wherever it's open. So we're gonna to have to have atmospheric pressure at this end and at this end. So what's the smallest amount of a wave that we could fit inside here while keeping those boundary conditions? Let's take a look. And we'll show it here just above the tin whistle. <clears throat> so low frequency sound. You see that wave? So that's a visualization of the wave that will be inside this tin whistle. We have the uh, atmospheric pressure at either end, yeah? And we can see in the middle, we're going from high pressure to low pressure, to high pressure to low pressure. So that's this wave that's bouncing up and down here. And it has that sort of a shape. So if I just shorten the tube by just removing a few fingers, let's have a look and see what that would look like. So we can see that same shape now has to be squeezed into a shorter space. So we can imagine if we were to show the full length of that wave, we could see that it has a short wavelength. Yeah? So it's going off into space here and with a short wavelength. So that means we hear the difference between this, this um, short wavelength and this long wavelength sound. Now, the one last thing I'm going to show you before I let you go is we can actually squeeze in different types of waves into this space while still satisfying the boundary conditions. Remember, all we need to do is make sure it's atmospheric pressure at both ends. Okay, so we saw one shape that works. Here's another shape that works. Okay, I'm going to do the full length of this whistle and I'll do it with the, um, uh, with, first you'll hear a low frequency, then a high frequency. <clears throat> I went from low frequency to high frequency, but I didn't lift any fingers. I didn't change the length. Well, what happened here was I put more energy into the system, which allowed me to set up the next wave that would satisfy our boundary conditions. And you can see what it looked like. We did the exact same thing. We had, had um, atmospheric pressure at either end, but we were able to fit in more wavelengths into the same space. So they got shorter. And we know that a shorter wavelength is a higher pitched sound. And I can even make it even shorter if I put in more energy. It's going to get loud. Here we go. <clears throat> Hear that? So we can put in more energy and we still satisfy the boundary conditions, but we squeeze more and more and more waves into this tiny space. So I hope you've enjoyed that, guys. And I hope it gave you a new way of visualizing how the sound moves around inside of wind instruments. And if you are someone who plays a wind instrument, I hope you'll have a little look at your own instrument and try and think about how this physics applies to yours. So thanks so much for tuning in, guys, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on the next one.